two parts. Uh, a interview of Mr. Bannon by Hussein Akani, whom I'll introduce in a second, and then some closing remarks by Hussein, who will wrap it all up, explain everything that's happened today and where we should go from there. But um, you've, throughout the day, you've seen my old friend and, and dear colleague Hussein Akani up here, but he hasn't, I think, so far been properly formally introduced. So let me say just a few words about Hussein. Uh, he is currently a senior fellow at the Hassan Institute. Uh, he has been the ambassador of Pakistan to the United States. Uh, he's a very uh, knowledgeable man about uh, the affairs of the Middle East, uh, South and Central Asia, a, um, a very wise man in his judgments, and also a very brave man, uh, and he's often had need of that uh, courage um, to, uh, because he has occasionally found himself in rather unfortunate circumstances. The trunks of cars uh, of Secret Service people in Pakistan, a house arrest in Pakistan while he was still serving as ambassador. Um, and throughout that, he has kept uh, a remarkable degree of equanimity and uh, also has managed to reflect on it uh, without, uh, he's certainly entitled to anger, but uh, he didn't let that cloud, cloud his judgments. So it's a great pleasure to present to you, in a formal way, uh, Ambassador Hussein Haqqani. Uh, thank you, Hillel. And of course, depending on your political perspective, you can interpret the absence of light in two ways. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you belong to the left of the political persuasion, you might say that this is appropriate because the forces of darkness are, 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 are up here. <laughs> And if, you, and if you have a different perspective, you would say that there is some source of illumination in the light on this stage, uh, in, in the absence of light. <clears throat> now, we've had a full day today. We have, had many, we have heard many voices. Uh, we have had several speakers. We have had several panels. We have heard from Republicans, Democrats, uh, senior retired officials, generals, uh, two ex-CIA directors, um, and so the last thing that you needed, uh, we thought, was an exile talking to an insurgent. <laughs> um, I don't think I need to introduce uh, Mr. Steve Bannon. Uh, he is the former White House strategist and the executive chairman of Breitbart News. He has interesting uh, things to say even for those who do not agree with him. And it's important for us to hear his perspective. Uh, any attempt at trying to introduce him would only get me into greater trouble uh, than is necessary. Everybody knows who he is, and I welcome him on behalf of the Hudson Institute to this conference. Um, I would just begin by saying that uh, Mr. Bannon is identified uh, with the idea of America first. And there are those who would say that America first would be more of an isolationist idea. His agreement to come and join us today actually gives us an opening to ask him to share with us some of the ideas that he would say he has about the topic today, which we all know is countering violent extremism, Qatar, Iran, and the Muslim Brotherhood. So four different subheadings of the title, but they all fall within the rubric of uh, the the national security requirements of the United States, and foreign policy. Steve, why don't you start with an opening statement yeah. that then sets the pace for us having this conversation. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, I'd like to give a quote just to start off. We will reinforce old alliances and form new ones and unite the civilized world against radical Islamic terrorism, which we will eradicate completely from the face of the earth. That was... Um, that was Donald J. Trump, a few minutes after high noon on January 20th, 2017, his inaugural address. We will eradicate completely from the face of the earth radical Islamic terrorism. Now, there's a lot of confusion 
<clears throat> or misinformation, fake news about who wrote that inaugural address. Um, President Trump, or at the time President-elect Trump, wrote it. Stephen Miller and myself were honored to uh, help him out, as was Jared Kushner and Hope Hicks and Kelly and Conway, Jason Miller. Some other folks, as we helped maybe craft it or, or structure it. But he wrote it. He particularly, he wrote that sentence. And uh, I remember, uh, I think he wrote that, that line and the, that part of the speech in, um, back in November, December um, at Mar-a-Lago. This is the first time we talked about it. And then back in Trump Tower. Uh, Stephen Miller and I, uh, and General Flynn at the time, talked about him. That's a, that's a pretty big check to write because somebody's going to have to cash it. And he said, this is my obligation to the American people as commander in chief. If you go back in time, President Trump strongly believed that the reason that he was on uh, the podium on January 20th and Hillary Clinton wasn't was that it came down to a decision of the American people of who would be the best commander in chief in a time of war. And I think one of the things that President Trump and candidate Trump at the time remembered is that we're now fighting, this is the longest war in the nation's history. I think in actual combat time, it's longer than the Revolution, the Civil War, World War I and World War II. I think if you add it all up with actual time in combat, I think that this is the, uh, the longest sustained military conflict we've ever had. President Trump uh, and his whole candidacy from the very beginning when he came down that uh, escalator in Trump Tower was a repudiation of the elites, the repudiation of the foreign policy establishment, a repudiation of the party of Davos, uh, a repudiation of this concept we've had of this rules-based international order of which the American working class and middle class underwrite with their taxes and more importantly with the, um, the blood of their children. You know, I had a little skin in this game back in, in 79 80, I was a naval officer on a destroyer in the North Arabian Sea in the Persian Gulf during the original hostage crisis. My daughter's a West Point graduate, served with the 101st Airborne in Iraq after she graduated. Um, you know, if she stays in the Army, she's Army captain, may eventually deploy back. I've had many nephews and, and cousins and folks like that in my extended family have served in the Middle East. In fact, my kid brother was a pilot, was, uh, was in Libya back in, I think it was 83, 84. Um, these wars have gone on for a long time. President Trump in the campaign, and particularly when I was able to step in as CEO with Kellyanne Conway as campaign manager, it was just during the end of the of Mr. and Mrs. Khan's uh, the crisis around the Khans, the Gold Star family, and the and the death of uh, of that hero, Captain Khan. Um, and the president, one of the things we talked about was how you compare and contrast himself with Hillary Clinton, one of the strongest. Uh, thing she had going for her when she was running was her foreign policy experience, her time on the Senate Armed Services Committee, her time as Secretary of State, her vast knowledge of all the ins and outs and the minutia of, of foreign policy. And President Trump, I think, really connected with the American people. And he talked about a couple of things. We're at war. And remember at that time when he came down in 2015, we were seeing a rise of ISIS that was really had caught the world by surprise. I mean, ISIS had, had done more than, than anybody, even the Muslim Brotherhood historically, in, in actually having a physical caliphate. Eventually that caliphate was seven or eight million people, oil refineries, the ability to tax uh, wheat fields, the ability to have essentially slave markets and recruit from all over the, the known world, including Asia, Europe, and the United States. You also had, uh, for the Obama administration, because of their focus on the, the nuclear deal, you had a, a, a insurgent or resurgent Persia, very aggressive on its expansion of Iranian expansion. And you also had the continual uh, specter of radical Islamic terrorism. President Trump could not have been more blunt, more direct, and spoken in a more plain spoken vernacular to the American people what he wanted to accomplish. And from the very first day that, uh, that uh, he won, I remember to General Flynn at the time, what he wanted to do was to, at the National Security Council, devolve the power back to the combatant commanders, to the Pentagon, to the CIA. He would set overall strategy. 
but that they would take a more active role and a more aggressive role in the destruction of ISIS. Um, in addition, he was going to review the uh, Iran nuclear deal. Remember, he said during the campaign, I'm going to try to make that deal better. I'm a, I'm a deal guy. I'll try to get into it. And if we can't, I will decertify it. I will terminate it. But one thing I will do is connect their, um, uh, their aggression throughout the Middle East and the rest of the world uh, and their behavior to that deal. And the third, he says, that we've got to figure out how to take care of radical Islamic terrorism that's not ISIS related. Once he took, we took office, one of the top things he had Jared Kushner, myself, um, then Secretary Tillerson work on was a summit, was this summit. To, he wanted to bring uh, the Arab world together uh, and to really put, I think, beyond people that he had run as an Islamophobe or was not, did not want to be actively engaged or that America first did not mean that you're going to be actively engaged in, in a territory. And I think anybody that thinks we're isolationist or that his philosophy is isolationist. I don't know how you look at the Arab summit that took place in, uh, in the Muslim summit that took place in, in May of, of 2007. In Riyadh. In Riyadh. And by the way, the three parts of that, the three component parts that were worked on from day one was to take care of, number one, the financing and support of radical Islamic groups throughout the world. Number two was to work with the Arab world and the Muslim world particularly with people like General Sisi had had that great speech at Cairo a few years ago on New Year's Day, and to work with the Arab and Muslim world about the uh, engagement of Islam with modernity and the ability of Islam to internally reform itself by Muslims doing it. Not imposition of Western values on the Muslim world, but the, but the Muslim world and the Islamic world um, reforming certain aspects of its religion and its faith that led to certain parts of this radicalization. And the third was to really start to have a serious conversation about what type of military alliance or what, t what had to happen to stop Iran's expansion, Persian expansion, in this arc across from Iran to the sea through the capitals of Baghdad and Damascus and Beirut, and also about what was happening on, the Persian, uh, on, the, on Yemen with this kind of pincer move through the Arab world. What's happened in, 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 in seven or eight, what is it, nine months? I mean... We've, President Trump has accomplished something that I think people would, would, would have mocked and laughed at him uh, in the campaign. Raqqa fell the other day. I mean, the physical destruction of the ISIS caliphate, which shocked the world on its rapid rise, and I think put the world back on its heels about how can this kind of, you know, group of young people with a, a, a couple of spiritual leaders in the in the call to arms they had from that 900-year-old mosque in Mosul. How could they have an economic capital in Mosul and a spiritual capital in Raqqa? And how could they have 8 million people that could be taxed? It, it, was, it was breathtaking. The whole world kind of backed off. In eight months of President Trump's strategy, executed by General Mattis, and that strategy was not a war of attrition. It was very specific from day one. This will be a war of annihilation. We will physically annihilate the caliphate. And that's what's been accomplished. If you look at uh, the summit, the second part of it is that they went into the summit. We went into the summit with UAE and Saudi Arabia and others. And the number one thing was we must take care of this financing of, of, of radical Islam. And, and there could be no more, as President Trump says, no more games. You can't have it both ways. You, you can't on one side say you're a friend and an ally and on another side be financing the Muslim Brotherhood or Hamas. You know, you can't be on our side and say you're our friend and on the other side being, you know, open to Iran and particularly to Iran's aggressive warlike, the mullah's warlike uh, posture to the United States and to the West and to the, and to the other Islamic uh, countries. Uh, and that you can no longer have it both ways. And I think that it's not, you know, the summit came. I think President Trump's speech at the summit is one of the great speeches any political leader in the United States has ever given. I think it, it put to bed or should have put to bed that President Trump was an Islamophobe or somehow his administration, the people that worked for him, and particularly the deplorables and the people that voted for him, did not want an active engagement with the Islamic world, understanding as partners that we had to take care of, that we'd have to go through this time together. And as partners, we would come out on the other side and the world would be a safer and more robust and vibrant place. Um, and I don't think it's any, I don't think it's just by happenstance that two weeks after that 
uh, summit that you saw the blockade by the United Arab Emirates and, uh, and uh, Bahrain, uh, Egypt, and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia uh, on Qatar. And I've said from day one, I think that even with the situation in the Northwest Pacific with Korea, I think the single most important thing that's happening right now in the world is the situation in Qatar. Okay, so there are three or four things that you've said that need a little more elaboration. The first, which I think is a positive, uh, you made it clear that the Trump administration and those who were instrumental in bringing uh, President Trump to the White House are not Islamophobic and they do want to engage with the Islamic world, but they want to do it in a different way. Um, that needs elaboration because that's quite contrary uh, to the way things are perceived. The second thing that needs a little more clarification is you make it seem that the last 10 months uh, have uh, uh, represented a major uh, clearly thought out step-by-step uh, -step approach to the problem. Uh, and you give credit to the Trump administration for the success uh, of the Iraqi uh, military and the Kurdish militias uh, in relation to the Islamic State. And there are people who would attack that or criticize that or say that that's not true. So I would like you to kind of make the, the, the next point, which is why do you think that what has happened is actually the result of policy and not the result of developments within the region. And the third is the Qatar question. Uh, it seems that, it's a, uh, that the American policy has been two steps forward and then two steps backward again. Is it really the change that you said it was or is there something else happening uh, in the administration uh, that you decided not to share with us in that initial statement? Uh, let's take the first. I, I, I think that if you, um, number one, this whole thing of America first being isolationist or it's us against the world is, I, I just think it's total nonsense. He looks at the world in a different way. It's very, uh, Walter Russell Mead would say Jacksonian. I think that President, Bush, uh, President Trump looks at things in a Jacksonian that it's, it's what's in the vital national security interest of the United States is what you should commit to. And in those areas of the world where it's in the vital national security interest of the United States, you will have partners that will be in their vital national security interest also. And that you work, whether it's the Northwest Pacific with Japan and South Korea, or whether it's in uh, the Gulf with people like the UAE and, uh, and Saudi Arabia and Egypt and Bahrain. So I think that there's a, a tremendous thing of engagement. I don't think there's anything President Trump has done in this administration, it makes us look isolationist at all. Uh, I think he doesn't want to get into these kind of arrangements like TPP and others where we're just another, uh, another person at the table, another entity at the table, and not something that we know it's in our vital national security interest. As far as being Islamic phobic, I mean, I, I, would, I would talk to our allies in the region. I would talk to Egypt and the UAE and uh, Saudi Arabia. I don't think anyone's given uh, the now Crown Prince MBS more support on Vision 2030. Mohammed bin Sul Salman. Salman is, is uh, in 2030, which is a complete, not just reorientation, but almost a restructuring of their economy and eventually their society, um, in which I think they've made tremendous strides on. A lot of people say, well, it's a very imperfect plan, and, but you have to understand they're trying to do something in 10 or 20 years that it's been centuries building up. I don't think anybody's been more supportive. And, and I take that exactly from the quotes when we had the summit of what the king said, what the deputy crown prince said, what the crown prince said, and what many of the leaders of, of Saudi Arabia said. Uh, also, uh, the UAE. I don't think, I, I, if, you, if you talk to these individuals, and they talk to the media all the time, is that for many years of actually the Obama administration being disengaged, that President Trump has leaned into this and leaned into it in every aspect of it. Now, about the developments or, or the, the destruction of, of, of ISIS. That's an, another thing. Certainly there was done with, with, with allies. It was done with most of the troops in Iraq that eventually you know, went and took Mosul, to, to Kurdish troops in Peshmerga and Raqqa. But I think that's once again uh, to what President Trump's trying to get across. It's not gonna be America that has to lead here. It is our local, you know, when it's in the vital national security interest of the United States, it's going to be in the vital national security interest of other people. And you have to show their support. And you have to show their, uh, you know, you have to show uh, that you're in, in not just financial support, military support, 
political support. It shouldn't be lost on people that the, uh, the extreme vetting, what's called the travel ban, you know, the difference, the, really the fundamental difference between the first and the second, one of them was Iraq came off. And that was after further discussion and further analysis and further State Department involvement. It was derived that, you know, Iraq should go back on there. One was because of the fight against, against ISIS, what they were doing. Other, it was also what they had done to make sure that people were fully vetted before they came to the United States. And so that's the, uh, the, the second question. Your third question was? Uh, the, the, the third question was about Qatar. That is it a two-step forward, two-step backward approach? Because there seems uh, yes. to have been a step backward after Riyadh. I think there's, look, there is, you know, President Trump, one of the reasons he's president of the United States, one of the reasons he's president and Hillary Clinton is not, is I do believe that there was a <clears throat> fundamental rejection by the American people of much of what the foreign policy establishment of both political parties have stood for. Kind of this, we had talked before, Davos man, or the consensus of, of what American foreign policy, of, you know, how it devolved that we're in the Middle East the way we're in, and the blood and treasure that, we, that we've left. In the same situation as why have we not focused on the rise of China, so the opportunity cost of our engagement in the Middle East. And I think the war is with no end. I think the working class and middle class people in this country are looking at the taxes we pay, they're looking at the trillions of dollars that have been spent, they're looking at the veterans that come home that, are, that have PTSD, that are horribly wounded. They're looking at Section 60 over at Arlington National Cemetery, the young men and women that have died that we've buried over there, and I think they've looked at the trillions of dollars, and I think that it was rejection. And so with President Trump, it was let's try to bring these wars to some sort of culmination. And victory matters. I mean, you know, President Trump is not a quitter, and he's certainly not losing. The American people are not either. And it's not just the sunk cost of being there. We understand that these things have to be done now. I do believe there's aspects of the foreign policy community that are, you know, are quite uh, are quite inextricably linked uh, that don't share those don't share those point of points of view. I fundamentally believe that, particularly in Qatar and particularly after the after the summit, the Muslim summit, it was looked as an opportunity to be seized instead of a crisis to be managed, and that you know Qatar finally had to be called to account for their continual funding of the Muslim Brotherhood, their continual funding of Hamas and their engagement with both Iran and, quite frankly, Turkey in, in the Gulf. And I think it was pretty, you know, if you look at people on our side of the footprint, I realized I, you know, at the time, in setting up at the summit, uh, and I'm not a foreign policy expert by, by far, but it's, I, I took a very hard line in that, is that I thought the UAE and the Egyptians and, uh, and uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia uh, had, a, had a well thought through plan. I thought these had to bring that, if we're gonna stop the financing of radical Islamic terrorism, that it has to be cut off 100%. And if you cut off the funding, you cut off support, we could really have a chance to eradicate it from the face of the earth, which is what President Trump laid out to the American people he was going to do. But it's not being fully implemented. I think there's two things on engagement. You know, the State Department, Secretary Tillerson, I got tremendous respect for, for, for Rex Tillerson. I was one of the people that was most aggressive about trying to get in the administration at the time. Um, I think there was just a fundamental, and I, I brought this, uh, you know, that I, I want to make sure that everybody, and I'm sure they've gone through it earlier today, but one of the things that was most, I think, people came down on two sides of were the original 12 demands that were put out. And I think these demands are, quite frankly, pretty straightforward. And, and the UAE and Egypt and Saudi Arabia didn't say the demands had to be met. What they said is that these are what the framework has to be for discussions. And let's go through those demands. Number one, that Qatar will curb <laughs> diplomatic ties with Iran and close its diplomatic missions there. Number two, that it will sever all ties to terrorist organizations, specifically the Muslim Brotherhood, the Islamic State, Al-Qaeda, and Lebanon's Hezbollah. And they will formally designate these entities as terrorist groups. It will shut down Al Jazeera and all its affiliate stations. It will also shut down outlets that Qatar funds directly and indirectly. Arab uh, B21, Rasid, Arab El Jihad, Middle East I. It will immediately terminate the Turkish military presence in Qatar. It will stop all means of funding for individuals, groups, or organizations that have been designated as terrorists by Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Egypt, Bahrain, the US. It will hand over terrorist figures. 
It will end interference in sovereign countries' internal affairs. It will stop all contacts with political opposition in Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Egypt, and Bahrain. It will pay reparations for loss of life. It will consent to monthly audits and it will align itself with other Gulf and Arab countries along the 2014 Memorandum of Understanding that I believe it, I believe it, uh, it was party to um, reach with Saudi Arabia. Now, I realize some people think that's over the top, and some people think that Qatar would essentially give up its, its foreign policy if it did that. <clears throat> um, I don't say that I agree with maybe all of those, but I do agree that I thought that was a pretty good construct of which to sit down. And I believe it's, I believe it's a construct today, and I don't believe, I believe it's well within the rights of people that we agreed at that summit. There was an agreement that there was going to be an effort to have a 100% cutoff of the funding of radical Islamic terrorism. And I believe our allies in that region, UAE, Egypt, in uh, Saudi Arabia, not only agreed to that, they were the drivers of that. And you think that they are, uh, as drivers, implementing it firmly, whereas Qatar is not <coughs> implementing the uh, mechanisms that will stop terror financing? What do you mean in the wrong Me country? Meaning Saudi Arabia, UAE, you think that they are no longer uh, uh, doing anything that can be construed as supporting any radical Islamist groups. We know that the UAE runs a major anti-extremism uh, effort. Uh, but there have been people who say that other countries in the region have not firmly... Uh, let's, talk about, let's talk about the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, because I think everybody will throw up you know, right away, but they're, they're just as bad. Look at, the, look at the tectonic plate shifts we've had from the, the summit and this is why I think it's, it's not fair to President Trump. And I'm not here as his apologist. I'm here as just a, 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 a guy that's a veteran. And Maybe his advocate, not his apologist. Is, is, is a, okay, I am his advocate, but, but also a parent and a veteran and a taxpayer and a citizen. You know, what's been accomplished in a very short period of time, to me, is, 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 is amazing. I don't think he's gotten the credit for the summit, because I think the summit was incredibly important. I think it was important in the Muslim world. I think it was important in the Arab world. I think it was important to show that the United States was fully engaged. It wasn't a bunch of happy talk, and action was going to take place from that. If you look at Saudi Arabia, I mean, they've had a pretty big fundamental change since that summit. Deputy Crown Prince then is now the Crown Prince. I think it was two weeks ago or three weeks ago, there were a thousand <clears throat> clerics that were, I don't know if rounded up or somehow put under house arrest, whatever, I realize that the opposition party, New York Times, refers to them, most of them as liberal scholars, right? I, I, would, I, would, I would respectfully submit if you flip through an intelligence report or two. I, I, but, I, I will have to sort of, you know, stand up for the New York Times here. They're not the opposition party. Uh, they're people who disagree with you, just as you disagree with them, right? I, I, I could, could not disagree more. Well, that's a debate for another time. <laughs> Um, but I think that there's been huge changes in, in, in Saudi Arabia. I was also just joking. I know, I know, Ambassador. The, the, but I, I, and I think Saudi Arabia, I think people realize that there are definitely issues in, in, um, with other countries. I think they're making an effort, but it's nowhere near of what Qatar and its, its, active, <clears throat> its active involvement with, uh, with that. And also I would say that Qatar has run a influence operation here since this all came about. They spent millions of dollars to try to change the opinion of congressmen and thinkers and think tanks and, 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 the, and, the, uh, and the elites in this city. And well, they I, had a story today that said that, you know, you are being paid by one of the other Gulf countries to influence opinion the same way. Yeah. So, but, that, okay, that's a company I have nothing to do with. Okay. Right, right? It was a company. Uh, hang on, hang on. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's a good point. They're, they're a company that somehow has taken, you know, has some sort of financial relationship. I have nothing to do with those guys. Okay. But I understand how the cutteries are trying to throw that up to chop right. block me before I come. And by the way, that's, that's all in the fair, that's fair, fair play in this thing. However, I think they're both missing the point. The, the one that came out the article with me today and also their other influence operation is that the American people can't be fooled about this. The American people, I think it's one of the powers of, of President Trump, and it's a, it's a power of him as a candidate. He can connect to the American working class, the American middle class, in a very plain spoken vernacular. And I'm a huge believer in the common sense and decency um, and judgment of what we call the common man, right? That's why I'm a populist. And I'd rather depend upon their judgment. And in fact, you know, we were in Fairhope, Alabama a couple of weeks ago for, for, for Judge Moore in, in an old barn with a sawdust floor. And I said at the time, I would take the first hundred people that came to that rally to 
to govern the country than the top 100 partners at, at Goldman Sachs. I'd want to reiterate that I would take the top 100 to form our foreign policy than the top 100, first 100 at Davos. That I think it's that important. And those people are not going to be convinced that Qatar, continuing to finance the Muslim Brotherhood, Hamas, and being in bed with Iran is a good thing. <coughs> um, we are towards the end of the session. Uh, General Petraeus this uh, morning said that uh, you can't just use Delta Force operations and drones uh, to get rid of the problem of radical Islamist uh, extremism and terrorism, uh, that this may actually end up being a multi-generational issue, and that the same may apply to the containment of Iran. Um, how would you describe your views on the comprehensive approach that is needed to both Sunni extremism, represented by groups like Al-Qaeda and ISIS, etc., and, and the Muslim Brotherhood, and Shia extremism that is represented by the yeah. clerical regime in Iran. What would be your multi-generational approach, and how would it differ from what you call the establishment? Number one, I, I think this, you show it in Afghanistan, is that we say multi-generational approach. There's nobody in the United States that wants to be engaged in combat operations, special forces operations, drone operations, multi-generational. I just think that is, it's just not where the American people are. It's not the way our country was founded or formed. Um, I think that the summit, I think this was so important about how President Trump structured the summit and what he wanted to accomplish. We're prepared to be allies. What we don't want is these countries to be protectorates. It's a big difference. We're prepared to be allies. That's why I think the action against Qatar was so important. And that's why I keep telling people all the time that actually what's happening in Qatar is every bit as important as what's happening in North Korea. That in Qatar, all the themes come out, right? And I think it's very important. That, and, and our allies in Egypt, in the UAE, in Saudi Arabia, understand that we're there for them. But we're not looking at, it's not our fight. It's your fight. It's if you're going to reform Islam and bring it into modernity, that, that's a huge civilizational and cultural aspect, and it's yours. We're there to be an ally. We're there to be a partner for needed. We don't look at it as multi-generational that we're going to have combat troops. That's why I was so adamantly opposed to our, uh, what happened in Afghanistan. And by the way, you should know in President Trump, President Trump weighs and measures this. We took, what, six months to make the decision in Afghanistan. That's because President Trump weighed and measured every alternative because he believes every American life is important. Every American taxpayer dollar is important. What I disagree in Afghanistan is what I, I don't think the Gulf is totally different. In Afghanistan, I believe we've tried to impose our values. I believe we're trying to impose a liberal democratic system on a society that clearly, to me, doesn't seem to, 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 to want it, which I think is fine. We should not be, and I think this is America first, we're not looking to transform the world into our values. I think we're, I think the world has got to come to its own conclusions, right? How it wants to govern themselves. And hopefully they'll see in the example that we have in, in, our, in our own country that, hey, maybe the things in the American system, maybe the things of the American people, maybe the things of democracy, represented democracy that they will take. And so I do agree with General Petraeus that you have to have a more total approach. I disagree with the fact of, particularly General Petraeus and some others, that have looked at this as nation building. We have to build a nation called the United States of America. And in building that nation, and in being a strong partner, and having the vibrancy and the robust nature to be able to partner with people like UAE and, and, and Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Bahrain and Egypt, as they go through this massive transformation of both their economies and their cultures, we'll be their partner. And the way we can do that, the way we can have Pax Americana, is that if we're a robust and strong society ourselves, not trying to impose our way of life and our beliefs on other people. So you would not have any role whatsoever or any actions that would imply trying to remake the world in America's image. You want to accept the world as it is and yet uh, try and interact with the rest of the world with American values and let them pick their own? Well, it, it, American values are, are from America and I know that, that we have certain universal beliefs. I think that you have to show the world how you implement those beliefs and how you execute upon them. And if they want to emulate them, they can emulate them. But we can't go and enforce it. The, you know, these societies are thousands of years old. Honestly, I, I think we've missed the plot here because what the, the, the geniuses in the foreign policy elite, what they left on President Trump is essentially 
the Bay of Pigs in Venezuela, the Cuban Missile Crisis in Korea, and the Vietnam War in Afghanistan, all at one time. This President Trump didn't, didn't do this. The, the, the deplorables that voted for President Trump didn't do this. This is the geniuses of both political parties. Both political parties deliver this upon us. In addition, besides what they've allowed to occur in the Middle East, of which now President Trump is trying to work with partners to try to pick up the pieces and to bring some, some stability and some safety to the region. We, we see the rise of China to a, uh, what President Xi said the other day is going to be a hegemonic power based upon a Confucius mercantilist model that will have massive implications for the United States and its place in the world. President Trump didn't do that. That's all the geniuses that, uh, and, and by the way, the, last week in a span of, I think, 24 hours, we had the speech of President Xi, the speech of President Bush, and the speech of Senator uh, McCain. And I would respectfully submit that President Xi's speech was an adult speech uh, to adults, and that President Bush and President McCain's speech uh, was just more pablum, and that the reality is what Donald Trump has done in that summit and what he promised the American people on inaugural day and what he's implementing every day as he goes out and works with his tremendous uh, team to try to implement this. Well, the foreign policy elite of Washington, D.C. that asked me to interview today told me that when you start talking about issues other than those that relate to this conference, I should bring this to an end. So I'm going to bring it to an end right now. <laughs> uh, Steve Bannon, thank you for doing this. And it was a pleasure. Thank you, Ambassador. Ladies and gentlemen, we are at the end of our, our day-long deliberations that